Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another video. Um, as you know, my name is Tom Buck. I'm the owner and managing director of the Calder Group, which includes Calder Finance Midlands Limited. And today we're going to be talking about an area of investments that we haven't covered so far during the whole COVID-19 crisis. Um, and it's an area that we do a lot of work in, a lot of discussions with clients, talking about business relief, but non or asset backed, so non equity business relief investments and how they've performed with everything that's been going on when we've seen great volatility on the markets. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Stella Asset Management and Matthew and Alistair, who are the experts and going to be uh, answering several tough Jeremy Paxman style questions. Good morning, guys. Morning, Tom. Morning, everybody. Morning, Tom. Morning. Um, right now that I put them on edge, we'll uh, we'll go there. So uh, I, I think let's start with the the obvious one, guys. Um, we know what asset backed business relief investments are. Nice big mouthful, but what are they? Yes, well, um, backtracking slightly, Bus business relief is a piece of legislation. Uh, it's been in legislation for quite some time which provides relief from inheritance tax at 100%. Um, so it's, it's full relief from, from the 40% inheritance tax that's payable. The qualification, though, is you have to invest in activities that qualify for that relief. Um, and there's two types in the main. One is, as you mentioned, the equity-based route, which is largely AIM shares, is the, is the route most people know. And the second route, then, would be any qualifying any other qualifying business activity um, and qualifying business activities actually are quite wide uh, in the UK it's largely uh, any company or business that makes something manufactures something or provides a service so there's an awful lot of qualifying business activities um, the reason asset backs is focused on though is because generally when people do this kind of planning they're looking to leave assets to their next of kin, their children. So creating a legacy which they pass on to their children. Therefore, choosing qualifying business activities that have uh, a lot of security in the form of asset backing is a really good way of minimising or reducing risk. Okay. So, yeah. So when we talk about asset backs, what we mean is you've got... Um, a qualifying business activity, for instance, is operating a hotel. So we might invest the client's money into a hotel um, and the clients would own the freehold or the long leasehold that the hotel sits on, the building itself and any associated uh, uh, assets connected with the hotel. Um, so the beauty of the asset back part is you've got an operating hotel, but if it stops trading as a hotel, you still own the land and the building that sits behind that business. Okay, so you've got a slightly different approach to it, whereas obviously with equities, you're relying on the business, using a profit, creating value. What we're talking about here is business activity that has got some kind of asset, as you say, a hotel, golf course, I suppose, things like wind turbines and so on. That Correct. An extra capital value for the client on top of, uh, on top of what, what, what the normal trading activity is. That's correct. And uh, one, of our, one of our areas or, or one of the biggest areas that we're involved in, and we have been for over 20 years, is forestry investment. So forestry investment is a classic example of an asset backed investment strategy because you are in the land on which the trees are planted um, and, and the land has a value. It doesn't have the same kind of value, though, that residential land or residential development land would have, because often it's in parts of the country where you can't easily get access to it. Um, and then the value comes from your trees as they grow, as they get bigger, the capital value gets bigger um, and, they, and they grow, I think it's about a foot a year or something and they get bigger. So there's value being added year on year on year. And then you, you, you take your value out when you start harvesting your trees. And in fact, on that point, this is why, you know, Sting, uh, Brian May, lots of these celebrities, Paul McCartney, they all own Scottish woodland. Um, because it affords them the the uh, relief from inheritance tax. It's a great way of protecting your money and passing it down to the next generation. Yes, I know um, famously James Dyson is is buying farmland for pretty much the same same thing, although that is obviously agricultural 
relief rather than and necessarily straight business relief. Think and realize there's an asset back there, there's a value, um, and yeah, as you say, it can pass it on to the next generation without paying inheritance tax, so it gets quite a sizable chunk of wealth across. Absolutely right. Uh, and in fact, so we, we also operate farming as well. Um, although out of everything, it's one of the sectors that's been hardest hit by the Brexit negotiations. So we can't rule out external factors all the time. We do the best we can. But where you have something like the, the uh, Brexit and the removal of the Maastricht, uh, or the, sorry, the Common Agricultural Policy benefits, it does affect the market so the market that market particularly is in limbo a little bit until um you know those those conversations resume um but what i was going to say was the reason the landed gentry managed to retain their wealth and pass that down through the generations is because if you think about the assets that they're holding they've got stately homes they've got farmland they've got copses they've got woodlands they own property so all we are doing with the kind of investments that we operate for clients is giving them opportunity to invest into the exact same areas as historically people have invested in to, put to, to, to do exactly the same thing. So okay. it's a, it's a well-tried, and te- uh, well-tried and tested strategy. Yeah, I would say it's, um, I often describe some of the work we do in our, our trust as actually you know, with our clients, we're doing things that the, uh, the, the wealthy have been doing for generations. I mean, I just yeah. want to come back there, Matthew. You mentioned, um, obviously, a risk in terms of the agricultural um, relief and the impact of a Brexit. I suppose a question that um, needs to be asked is what, what are the different risks that clients need to consider when you start talking about this type of investment? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, it, it, it's one of those interesting ones, isn't it? Because we're going into here parts of the economy where you can't get a regular valuation. You can't easily buy and sell a hotel and you can't necessarily sell your share in that hotel easily. Um, so I always start from the sort of the first point, which is normally when investors are looking to shelter their capital uh, in these types of uh, services, it's capital that they is surplus to their immediate requirements is the first thing so they should they should have a medium to long term investment horizon they should have no immediate call on their capital and they should realize when you put your, your capital into a scottish forest or a, a norfolk farm um we have to go through a process to exit to, to get them out um we can do that in a different way as well but that it's not a straightforward exercise um so once we've understood that part, we then look at some of the sort of risks, as you mentioned. What, one that often comes up from a client's perspective or from an advisor's perspective is to do with liquidity. Um, and we've just answered that, I suppose, by saying that they're not readily realisable all the time. But providing that the client understands and you address them and you address with the client the fact that this is money surplus to their requirements and they shouldn't need it. And we can get liquidity from elsewhere in your portfolio. In our experience, the liquidity point is less of a concern. Um, what you're then into is what's what's what, what's the, what's the volatility? What's the risk like in that particular asset class? Um, again, if we compare to equities, so in the recent COVID nineteen outbreak, as everybody knows, the stock markets around the world and the UK plummeted. Um, largely there's nothing anyone any of us can do about that um, and the equity markets will just continue to fall until they reach whatever plateau it is and then as we've seen they come back again um, and obviously some of those companies some of those aim companies and other companies that are listed companies can get into trouble there might be some 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 casualties airlines particularly have been affected pubs and you know, and so it goes on um, we're not exactly immune to that either uh, we operate hotels and our hotels have been largely closed for the period of the last three or four months uh, and obviously to maintain a going concern you need to have a certain amount of um, a certain amount of footfall coming through um, in normal circumstances though we are acquiring assets where we believe with our management team we can take a business that's turning over x and improve it to make it turn over y and then we would be looking to exit out of that investment and move on to the next thing. Got you. So, so 
a case of almost yeah it, you're running a business for people um using uh, investors money to obtain legislation but the risk is still there even with that lovely word asset backed and uh, to be fair we've heard some other providers go your money's guaranteed your money's secure you always sort of sit and go really um how yeah. secure yeah there is still that risk that if the business were to fail substantially then the capital is still at risk so the word asset back shouldn't be taken as guaranteed that's what we, we, we don't say guarantee yeah I, I totally agree with that so you've got you've got the sort of trading risk as you've mentioned you've got the macro market risk um and actually it's interesting with covid19 because covid19 is like the doomsday scenario that everybody talks about because it has closed everything you know all these businesses all over the uk all over the world um the beauty, though, of the asset back strategy is, A, you don't have that huge volatility. So there's no um, decrease in value, per se. Forests are still ticking along the same. Farming is still continuing. We do some renewable projects. They're continuing largely unaffected by, um, by, by COVID-19. We have got, as I say, hotel assets. But these are trading businesses with cash reserves. So, yes, they're closed at the moment. We're expecting them to open again in June, uh, sorry, in, on the 1st of July. So there's a trading risk for that period. Um, and then we'd expect, you know, kind of normal business to, re to, to return. It doesn't actually either derail our improvement plan on those assets either. It just delays it. So one of the other benefits uh, of the particular, the way we work with our, with our assets, we have no external debt in most of our um, projects which means we have full control, our investors have full control over the, over the, uh, the activity of that asset and how it's going to perform, uh, which means we've got control to sort of slow things down or speed things up, depending on what's happening. I was about um, to say, uh, I mean, you, you've, you've actually taken the next question, which is how has this actually performed over the last three months? We've seen, as you say, if you look at the, the equity markets, we saw a huge yeah. 25, 30% at the start of March as the whole world shut down. It's come back to a degree, and again, that's that's very much industry and almost globally um, depends how much it's come back. So, yeah. have you actually seen the asset backed market? I, I presume then, effectively, values have fair, been fairly stable because, again, you've done the basics of, of different asset allocation, I suppose. Yeah. So, the way that we give people access to the asset backed strategy is we would we usually create a company for them, a trading company, let's call it that. And then if they put two, you know, 200,000 pounds into that company, we would diversify them across a range of the different uh, qualifying business activities that we offer. So we are, I think, well, I think we are the most diversified, the most highly diversified manager in the marketplace. And currently we offer forestry, farming, residential, commercial, residential property development, commercial property development, owning and operating hotels, owning and operating care homes, owning and operating golf courses. Um, and we've also got, as I say, renewable energy and bridging finance in there. So as I said earlier, some of those activities um, have largely been unaffected by COVID-19. If you've got a bridging finance deal, really the arrangement is the lender. So we're the lender, the borrower, just has to pay the, in, the, the, the interest back over the period of the loan and then repays the loan to us in due course. That's largely been unaffected. We've had one or two casualties there where um, the loan's defaulted. Um, so we've had to repossess the house and we're trying to sell the houses in the market. But these are very you know, minor, minor exceptions to a much, much larger portfolio. Um, farming was already affected by Brexit. It hasn't been affected any worse than by COVID and forestry largely unaffected where we've got people involved so golf courses hotels and care homes there has been an impact not so much on the revenue stream of a care home because it's already full of people it's prevented us going to get new customers though because the doors effectively have been closed um and about until very recently sadly uh, well until two weeks ago we had no cases of covid um, we have now had a couple of cases identified, so we are keeping our fingers crossed and our thoughts obviously are with the families, uh, uh, etc. But 
it's one of those things that's very, very, very hard to control because you've got people coming in to give the care. So we've isolated to the best of our ability and we're monitoring. I think we believe the next two weeks are the critical part. After that, we hope to we hope to be free of it. So the point being, each the re and that's that 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 I suppose uh, underlines the reason that you have diversification. If your principal reason for doing something is to protect your capital and to pass it on, you don't want to have all your eggs in that proverbial basket. So our strategy always is to spread your money across multiple sectors which have different characteristics, which are all unlikely to be affected by um, the same thing, which is exactly what we're seeing at the moment. Where we do have an impact, we obviously then do our best to manage out that particular process and every single asset's different. Um, on the flip side as well, our golf, one of our golf courses in Southampton opened, I think it was last week, and they've driven, no pun intended, huge amounts of revenue through because now people are released, they can go and play golf. So the driving range takings have gone through the roof uh, and we expect quite a hard recovery on some of the assets um, there. Yeah, I was about to say, because obviously with, with what we've gone through in terms of, like say, things like forestry, energy and so on, yeah, you would expect that to carry on, farming carrying on, okay, where, where we're involved with human beings, obviously we, we've now got to be careful. And so I can see what you're doing to minimise the risk for investors' money by having that board spread, having different assets, and, and having the management experience as well, I guess, to, to cope with that. So where do you see the opportunities? Because as, as bad as this is, and like you say, for, for those who have gone through the, the illness, the, the loss of loved ones, you, you can't explain or can't even really find the words to explain the, 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 the sorrow that they're feeling. But from every bad thing, sadly, there is opportunity to move forward. And if we're thinking purely from a client point of view, is this creating opportunities? How do how does Stella see the future once we're through this, whether it's next year, this year, or we just have to live with this as a, a, a situation going forward? Yes, well, again, it's a, it's a really good question. So we've been uh, creating and managing inheritance tax planning portfolios for over 20 years now, 25 years probably. Um, and I suppose never has there been a time as, which serves as a reminder about the importance of doing planning. So, you know, by setting things up correctly in advance, prior to age, illness, any of these things or unexpected circumstances as we've had with COVID cannot be underlined enough. Um, if you've got the plans in place, it means you're prepared for the unexpected. Um, and by that, I mean things like the wills, the power of attorney, uh, you know, potentially thinking about earmarking assets for your children. So it's, I suppose, a very long way, winded way round of saying we expect that uh, there is going to be more attention paid to this kind of work in the future so that people don't get caught out. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm going to throw in a quick one here. I know we've spoken previously about it and... We're looking now at obviously record debt within the UK in terms of government debt, record borrowing. The furlough scheme, I think, is 15 trillion or 15 billion. You lose track of exactly what numbers they're, they're, they're talking about. I've always thought inheritance tax is such a small area, but actually it has a big impact and no one really knows it until you lose a loved one and then have to pay the, the bill. I suppose this is almost a case of saying, right, actually, the government, we know they've been looking at inheritance tax. Is this a call to arms to say, actually, this pretty much guarantees inheritance tax will be around and it might need more professional planning to make sure you mitigate it legally and do things right? Absolutely right. Well, I think last year, receipts, the UK government, um, £5 billion pounds, uh, of inheritance tax receipts were raised. That number is expected to double by the time we get to uh, 2030. So, so 10 billion a year is expected by the time we get to 2030. So there's two elements to this, aren't there? One, you've got the emotional planning. I want to leave assets to my children. I want to make sure that they can have the things they want to have in their lives and my grandchildren. Um, second is, I don't want to pay the tax. 
you know, I don't want to give the government 40% of the wealth that I've created. I prefer to give it to someone else. And then you've got the planning bit, which is don't get caught out. So one of the things we've been doing as a company, which I know you know about, is we've been working together with other um, professional service companies who are in the estate planning space because, you know, you and I are both only one little bit, really, of the wider picture. And I think if we can pull all that stuff together um, so that when your client comes to see you, you can give them the full array of services, keeping you in control, making sure they're very clear about what their outcomes are and why they're doing things, it puts them in a really, really strong position to avoid these kind of unexpected occurrences. Um, and obviously, we, we, I suppose the warning a little bit is the fact if we do have a second spike or a third spike, is it going to happen? How bad is it going to be? There's just so many unknowns with this with this virus, you know, sadly, aren't there? So it, it's, it's all about planning. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. Like you say, um, you, you don't want to uh, falsely concern people, but at the same point, this has almost been a wake-up call that there is a disease that we've got no cure for, we've got no vaccine for, and sadly, it seems to have been very much a case of, of attacking the more vulnerable in our society. So, yeah. yeah does become that you need to plan and i i agree if you if you've got a central point and it's why i've created the company in the way i have we can do everything with clients you avoid that well he said this he said that you've got that joined up thinking that really gets to the heart of the most important thing the client being exactly where they want to be which as you say is paying the right amount of tax not paying too much and passing the majority on to the children Yes, and I think for you know for your clients, um, really thinking hard about the objectives that they've got, um, and then you know you building a proposal which reflects that is is hot, really important. One of the things that our products or services do, which are perhaps different to other others in the market, is that actually we can tailor the outcome very much to suit the needs of the investor. So in some of our asset back portfolios, if a client specifically really likes to invest in hotels or forestry or whatever it might be, they can have that as a greater proportion or all of their portfolio should they want to. Um, equally, when we're dealing with families, you might have multiple members of a family investing together and we can create something that's unique for them. So inheritance tax planning doesn't have to be a, like a one size fits all solution. Uh, it can be highly personal to the family, to the individuals. And the beauty of the business relief element of it is that there's no passing of control so that, so that the client, mum and dad or whoever it's going to be, they have control and access to their capital for the rest of their lifetime. Um, at which point, because it's been held for two years or more, it can pass the next of kin with no inheritance tax liability. And the beauty of that is that if they should need their capital in five, six, ten years' time, that capital is all there for them, just in a nice tax-efficient place, and they can draw on it to pay for you know, long-term care or cruises or to buy a new car, whatever it might be. Yeah, no, uh, uh, hopefully uh, the cruises and the car on and the long-term care, but yeah, it's something that exactly. is important. Yeah, they, I, I see, in fact, I was talking to someone just the other day who the advice was received was just throw everything into a trust and you sit there thinking, well, mum and dad have now got no control. Yeah. And everything, and I think certainly with inheritance tax, it's such a complicated area. There's so many things you need to think about, so many different areas you need to consider. And it's mostly legislation that really, you know, for anyone who's watched this and thought this is interesting, please, 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 even if it's not from someone like myself, please go and seek professional advice before you take action because there are so many different providers. And as Matthew said, everyone works in a slightly different way. You really need to understand exactly what you're investing in if investing is the right way to go forward. Yeah. Matthew, um, Alistair's had a very, very easy today. Alistair, uh, obviously, I'm, uh, is going to claim this as a meeting later and say he's worked really, really hard. <laughs> um, but, uh, guys, thank you very much for taking your time out and helping to explain a little bit more about a very complicated but very beneficial area of financial planning. Really appreciate it. Thank no you very much. Thank uh, you.
Well, if you've got any uh, questions from this, um, our contact details will be on the video. We'd love to hear from you and have a chat. Um, but for my moment, Matthew Alistair from Stella, thank you very, very much for your time this morning. And thank you uh, for taking time to, to watch the video. Take care. Talk soon.